I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute. Welcome to the NEI podcast. On this show, I sit down with renowned mental health care experts from a range of diverse backgrounds to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental health conditions. In this episode of the NEI podcast, I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Balwinder Singh. He is a mood psychiatrist and assistant professor of psychiatry at Mayo Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. It's very nice to meet you, and thank you for inviting me for this NEI podcast. We're so excited to have you on. You were the poster winner at our last year's NEI Congress, and the title of your research was Comparative Effectiveness of Intravenous Ketamine and Intranasal S-Ketamine in Real-World Setting Among Patients with Treatment Refractory Depression. Can you share a little bit with us about what was it like when you discovered that you were the winner of our poster contest for your research on ketamine and S-Ketamine at last year's NEI Congress? Yeah, it was a very pleasant surprise, to be honest. I did not expect it. <laughs> it's, uh, it was my second time at the NEI Congress, and I was pleasantly surprised. And when I heard my name and I met with Dr. Stuck, it was a very pleasant experience and was great to share some of this very important clinical data at the meeting and um, get recognized for that. So, yeah. That's excellent. What would you say are some of the major differences between intravenous or IV ketamine and intranasal S-ketamine? Yeah, so when we look at ketamine as a drug, there are two major, what we call as mirror images, so as to say, with the when we look at the IV or intravenous ketamine, it's more the other name is racemic ketamine, which contains both R and S isomers, mm -hmm. whereas with the S ketamine or intranasal S ketamine, we are looking at just the S image or the S enantiomer of ketamine. Mm -hmm. So intravenous, as the name suggests, is given uh, IV as an intravenous infusion over 40 minutes, whereas intranasal S ketamine is just nasal spray and it's fi it has a fixed dosage. We start with 56 milligram and if patients do not respond to it, then we go to 84 milligrams. So the delivery system is different. And the other difference between the intravenous and the intranasal form of ketamine and S ketamine is the bioavailability. With intravenous form of ketamine, the bioavailability is almost 100%. Whereas with the what? intranasal S-ketamine, yeah, it's um, it's about 30 to 50 percent. So on an average, somewhere around 40, 50 percent in that range. So that those are the main differences. And when we use intravenous ketamine, we dose it based on the weight. Whereas mm -hmm. the intranasal S-ketamine, it has a fixed dosage, which is FDA approved for treatment-resistant depression. And what would you say was the main reason behind this study to do a comparison between the two? How is this clinically relevant? Yeah, that's a great question. My role as a mood psychiatrist, when I see patients with treatment-resistant depression, and I get, this, I, get, I get this question all the time, Dr. Singh, what's better? Is it IV ketamine or intranasal S ketamine? Because there is no head-to-head -head randomized controlled trial. Mm -hmm. Intravenous S ketamine, one of the first randomized controlled trial was published in 2006. And the intranasal S ketamine got the FDA approval in 2019. But right. at this moment, there is no head-to-head -head randomized controlled trial comparing these two interventions. So the main goal with this observational study is was to look at, okay, if we have patients who have treatment-resistant depression, and if one group of patients are receiving intravenous ketamine, another group of patients are receiving intranasal S ketamine, are we noticing any difference in the outcome? keeping in mind that this is not a randomized controlled trial, so there can be risk of biases. But in a real life clinical setting, what differences are we seeing? And are we getting some signal that is one intervention superior or is one intervention faster than other? So that was the kind of main reason when we designed this study to explore the invest uh, these two different interventions. 
That's so exciting. Can you talk us through the design of your study at the Mayo Clinic Depression Clinic? Yeah, absolutely. So this is what we call an observational study where patients with treatment-resistant depression, they received ketamine, whether it's intravenous ketamine or intranasal as ketamine, in a real world setting where patients are seen in the clinic and they are offered both IV and intranasal. And based on either patient preference or financial differences, let's say one group of patients receive intravenous ketamine and the second group of patients received intranasal as ketamine. And then we looked at their data and looking at how many of those patients remitted or responded to ketamine or intranasal as ketamine and how many or what number of treatments did they require to achieve that response or remission. So we call it as observational study. And then in that, we just follow those patients longitudinally. For this part of the study or this poster we presented at the NEI Congress, we looked at just the data for the acute phase. And when I use the word acute phase, it's where the patient received up to four to six intravenous ketamine treatment or with S-ketamine as FDA has approved, or they call it induction phase at time, where they received up to eight intranasal S-ketamine treatment to try to find who is a responder or non-responder and how many treatments did they required. And we included any patient who had treatment-resistant depression, regar- regardless of their comorbid condition. We had some Okay. Exclusion criteria, which we use in our clinical setting. So if someone had acute psychosis or any active substance use disorder, so we do not recommend ketamine for, for in such conditions. So th- okay. that was the main study design for this uh, study. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of those comorbidities, what were some of the comorbidities that patients had in addition to, as you mentioned, treatment refractory depression? Yeah, so when we look at the comorbidities, so majority of the patients had anxiety disorder. So about 63% of patients had comorbid anxiety disorder rather this and the most common was generalized anxiety, but some had even social anxiety. About 10% of patients had comorbid PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. About 11% of patients had fibromyalgia or chronic pain. About 5% of patients had eating disorder. About 8% of patients had history of borderline personality disorder, but they were more not as symptomatic. So the primary diagnosis was still major depression, but they had comorbid borderline personality disorder. About 13% of patients had a history of substance use disorder, but they were in active remission for more than a year. So those were some of the most common comorbid conditions or comorbidities in this this cohort. Okay. And I, I saw that neuromodulation techniques were used on some of the patients. How many patients in the study used these techniques? Yeah, we had a pretty treatment refractory group of patients. About 31% of patients had failed ECT or electroconvulsive treatment in their current episode before they came to the ketamine clinic, and about 16% had even failed transcranial magnetic stimulation. So they were pretty treatment refractory patients. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Amazing. What would you say were the results from your study? What did you find? Yeah, we found some very uh, interesting results. So one of the main results was, which has been already published, is we looked at what's the overall response rate with IV ketamine or intranasal as ketamine, and then we first compared what's the difference between that. And what we saw that the overall response rate with both IV and intranasal as ketamine is pretty similar. So when we look at the response rate, which is defined as 50% reduction in their depression symptoms was about 57% in the intravenous ketamine group and 60% in the intranasal S ketamine group. And it was not statistically different. So they were pretty similar. Remission rates, on the other hand, were, although they were higher, about 43% in the IV ketamine group and 27% in intranasal. It did not differ from a statistical standpoint, and a lot of that has to do with the the small sample size. We had about 62 patients 
in the study of those 47 received IV ketamine and 15 received intranasal as ketamine. Now, the, one of the main findings which we saw from this study is that patients who received IV ketamine, they required less number of treatments to achieve remission. So how do we make, yeah. So how do we make sense of that? So it's more like when they received IV ketamine or intranasal as ketamine, patients will respond faster or they, the number of treatment required to achieve response or remission is faster with IV ketamine in this study as compared to intranasal as ketamine. Although maybe at the end of the treatment, when they received that end of at that acute phase, the overall response rate was similar, but it's the number of treatment required to achieve that response or remission that seems to be faster with IV ketamine. Interesting, interesting. And that actually takes me to my next question, which is, were any of the results surprising and why? I think one of the things which we felt was a little bit surprising when we saw that the response rate was similar in both IV and intranasal. The reason behind that is when we see in the clinical setting, we, we, are, we tend to notice that patients who receive IV ketamine, they do better. But when we look at that, and that could be just our biases since there's no randomized controlled trial. So we were a little bit surprised when we saw that the response rate were similar. The other thing which was pretty robust finding was that the number of treatments required to achieve response was much smaller. We did not expect it to be this, the difference to be this significant where the hazard ratio was almost two or greater than two for IV. So that was a little bit surprising that we saw even this small sample size we saw that robust finding there. Wow. What would you say we can conclude from these findings at this point? Yeah, taking into account the limitations of a of an observational study where, you know, the both the groups are not randomized. But what if we from a as a clinician from a clinician standpoint, where I can use these findings is if I have to offer intravenous ketamine or intranasal as ketamine to the patients, this gives us a little bit more data to provide that extra information that, you know, if they are considering IV versus intranasal, the advantage is that with intravenous, they may achieve the response or remission. They may respond to the treatment sooner, whereas with intranasal, although the response rate may be similar, it may take some extra time or it may take a little bit longer to achieve that response. Now, the other thing we have to take into account, although we, this study cannot address that question, the IV ketamine is not FDA approved for right. depression. Right. So the problem with that is that some insurances do not cover it, whereas intranasal S ketamine is covered or FDA approved. Most insurances, they require some form of prior authorization. So that financial piece becomes important because each the IV infusion or ketamine infusion may cost somewhere between $300 to $500, depending on what part of the country someone lives in. With this data, this might provide some data to the insurance companies to start to realize they may it might be beneficial for them as well as for the patient if they start to cover IV ketamine, that they may require less number of treatments to achieve response and they get better soon. But I think that financial piece is another important aspect to which we can get some data there. How are you building on these re research findings now and what associated avenues have been explored since the study? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we are doing right now is we are looking at some of the side effect data. Are there differences between intravenous and S-ketamine? Some of the data is not published, but we are analyzing that. The second phase of the study is looking at the long-term outcome looking at patients who right. responded with IV ketamine or intranasal as ketamine in the acute phase, mm -hmm. what happens after those initial six to eight treatments? Right. Are they needing any more infusions or okay. are they staying in remission? Mm -hmm. So that's the next phase of the finding where we are exploring, we are investigating the data is how are these patients, how are the patients who are responding to IV or intranasal, how are they doing in long term? And the other aspect we are examining is, are there predictors? Can we predict 
who or are there some clinical predictors from this data who are you to know who will respond to IV versus intranasal? So that's mm-hmm. our future research and uh, trying to address those some of those questions. That's great. That's great. What, if any, challenges were there when it came to conducting this study? Do you have anything to share with us? Yeah, I think with any study, I think one of the main challenges is the funding. I think it, it took us a while right. for the study to be up and running. And then extracting the data and cleaning the data, I think those are, for any good study, those are some of the really critical factors, cleaning the data, going into the charts, and getting all that information <laughs> in an accurate manner so that the data can be analyzed and interpreted in, a, in the best way possible. So that takes me to my last question, which is, based on these findings, what advice do you have for clinicians who incorporate ketamine and or esketamine into their clinical practice? What can you tell us? Yeah, so I think based on this data, what I can advise is when we pick ketamine or esketamine, when we uh, are looking for patients who would be a good responder or non-responder, I think it's important to look for the exclusion criteria. So always be thoughtful when we are offering ketamine or intranasal esketamine because these are novel treatments. We do not have long-term safety data, although we cannot answer that question from the study, but be more thoughtful when we are offering these treatment because what we are seeing, the response and remission rates, they are much lower than some of the earlier studies when they were done. So when we look at the intranasal esketamine study, the response or the remission rate was almost 50% in one of the studies which was published in JAMA Psychiatry. But here we are seeing remission rate of only 27%. Thing, if we have to pick one versus another, it seems like IV ketamine has a little bit more edge over intranasal from a response standpoint, but that financial piece can play a big role. I think the other thing we have to think about when we are offering ketamine or esketamine is it's not a one-time treatment and fix all for everything. Most patients who are receiving IV ketamine or intranasal as ketamine, they are needing treatment for maintenance. So having be more thoughtful and monitor for any side effects or any cognitive side effects. There is some data with, with the ketamine abuse where people mm-hmm. can have interstitial cystitis. So do more regular monitoring for those symptoms long term. Mm-hmm. So those are some of the things I think I would suggest may be helpful from a clinical standpoint. Thank you so much for sharing all that amazing information with us. And I I do think this is very clinically relevant. We do know that these findings have been submitted to the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry and are under review. So if the study is published by the time this episode is released, we will update a link to that publication in our show notes. And I just wanted to take the time to thank you so much, Dr. Singh, for joining us. And congratulations again on being the winner of our poster session at NEI Congress. Thank you so much, Dr. Siegel. I appreciate all your best wishes and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. 